So since this is an academic form, I'll just quickly raise one methodological problem which has intrigued me. There are now a growing number of studies on Sharia councils, why women use them and so on. But by definition, that is a self-selecting group. What about those women who never go to the Sharia councils? What's their opinion? Why is their opinion never sought? Are they somehow not real Muslims um, in the eyes of academics and policymakers? That was just an aside. So this lack of empirical data about plural legal orders, non-state law, state law, and the, the fractures in between is, something, is, is global um, and something that I've published widely about. Um, I did put some brochures out on the desk, but they seem to have gone. Um, this was a, a paper for the International Council on Human Rights Policy called When Legal Worlds Overlap, Human Rights, State Law, and Non-State Law. Um, I've also, th there's also a UNIFEM's Progress of the World's Women biannual report is coming out, and this year it's on access to justice. And again, there's a whole discussion of legal pluralism and minority women. In a fairly broad sweep of the literature which I've done for these various reports, I found countless examples from every continent and every context of policy being based on supposition. And the most common mistake is to conflate practice with moral preference. So one of the most common examples is, is about my adopted home, Pakistan, and it's cited in almost all of the literature that there was a woman who went to the formal courts, and on coming out of the formal courts, she pronounces, I'd rather die than do that, go through that again. Okay? But once she's made this pronouncement in, the, in this writings, she's removed. Nobody asks, you know, what did she mean by that? Did she think, did she want the formal courts to be reformed so that they do meet her needs? Was this simply a matter that her family had put her through hell when she went through the courts? You know, we don't know. It's just used <coughs> as, as, a, as a symbol to say the formal law is terrible and therefore culturally inappropriate and therefore we must recognize non-state law. So my third point is that non-state laws, such as Sharia councils, are the pinnacle of all sexist evil or the solution to all racism. And I, I reject both of those positions. Justice system reform and the whole field of, of access to justice is subject to what um, the eminent and, and quite feminist legal anthropologist Franz von Bender Beckmann calls pendulum swings in policy. I'm going to be a bit less diplomatic and just say it's, it's plagued by fashions. You know, one moment it is, it's, it's all a fashion for unitary systems, the next moment it's all a fashion for non-state systems. Um, donors are trying to find quick and easy fixes to complex development problems. Government and non-state political forces all have a politi political <coughs> axe to grind. Whether it's neoliberal desire to privatize justice and relieve the state court system of the burden of, of so-called minor matters, such as family disputes or a desire by those with an absolutist agenda of identity politics to control their own communities and define, for instance, what is and what is not Muslim. However, and let's just stop and pause there, it's clear that legal pluralism is here to stay. It's a feature of life in developing and developed countries everywhere, the world over, not just in minority migrant communities. I mean, there's research about legal pluralism in Norway, for example, among Norwegians. Any legal matter that's settled outside the formal courts is part of legal pluralism. Therefore, pretending it doesn't or shouldn't exist is actually counterproductive and misses examining people's needs and practices on the ground. No! <laughs> okay, I'll try. At the same time, it's equally clear that legal pluralism, uh, that plural legal orders are problematic. And I'm summarizing the, the UNIFEM chapter here. As they currently operate, um, non state laws and parallel uh, religious laws or customary laws recognized by the state tend to be more discriminatory towards women than unitary systems. Aside from the content of, of plural legal systems, the structure is also discriminatory because it sets up differences between different women. Um, and there are often women who don't fall into the neat identity boundaries that all these systems set up. They marry across lines, religious lines, etc. Then also plural legal systems are harder to reform because there's such a political stake invested in them. They become, you know, the contestation is very hard. So I argue that ignoring the fact of legal plurality is both racist and deepens discrimination against minority women because it overlooks and doesn't address how things work in practice. But I also argue 
that the recognition of plural legal orders can promote racism. The presumption, for example, that you know, Muslims are different and therefore need difference. It can also promote sec sexism, since minority women are left at the mercy of a discriminatory community leadership. So my fourth point, what's the way out? Well, the simple answer is there are no simple answers. But I also very much object to the sort of, you know, postmodernist sort of sucking of teeth of, it's very complicated. Because I think saying everything is complicated is also a way of silencing rights-based critiques and rendering everything in need of experts. And actually, you know, establishing human rights is something that should be fairly straightforward. There are a number of, uh, of solutions. So, for example, recognize that culture is a human activity, political and contested, diverse and across within cultures. Second, keep, keep a commitment to the rights of the marginalized center stage in all policy, including within minority communities. Third, recognize that legal pluralism is here to stay and analyze its impact on minority women, including strengthening empirical knowledge. Fourth, avoid unhelpful binaries and essentializations. And instead, look at how rights activists the world over have on the ground risen above these binaries. You know, they, they live the life on the ground. They don't do cultural relativism and universalism. They just get on with it. And they've mediated their ways through these binaries. Yes, OK. Um, last bit? Yeah. OK. Women in Britain's Muslim communities, the this is the policy bit. Um, I should have talked about intersectionality and, and positionality and et cetera, et cetera. And Nira taught me all of that, so you, you know what I would say. Okay. Women in Britain's Muslim communities, the primary users of the non-state Sharia councils, because the system is unregulated, um, they're free to choose whichever council they fancy and even to ignore their pronouncements if they, in the end if they want to. And the anecdotal evidence, promise it's going to be quick, we're getting, and, and from a couple of PhDs, is that they're voting with their feet. They are going to the <coughs> Sharia councils that give them better, more gender-friendly uh, decisions. Because the councils depend not upon the state for their legitimacy, and because they're dependent on the community recognition, however slowly and however unwillingly, those Sharia councils are actually beginning to change. And this is something really we must look at. So when I started out saying that, you know, these are sort of a bunch of crotchety old men who are right-wing and discriminatory, <coughs> that was the polemic. And here's the nuance, is that for whatever reasons, many are changing and are trying to deal with things as best they can. We may criticize them, but they have been changing. And the change has come because of the women. How does the British government respond to this? Instead of supporting women's groups to... to support that change and encourage that change, whether it's men um, within the community producing new scholarship or it's women forcing the change. Um, the Ministry of Justice has not responded by supporting those processes, no. It's funded MINAB, the Mosques and Imams Advisory Board, to produce a vague pamphlet. In other words, the men should dialogue with the men and that's how change will happen. That is not mm. how change has happened mm. so far. Um, perhaps I leave it there. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>